Hi everyone, Spider-Man1991 here, and I'm going to do my comic reviews for the week of July 25th, 2012. Uh, start, uh, first of all, uh, starting off, we have Marvel, Wolverine the X-Men number 14. Uh, pretty much just like the cover shows, Colossus, who's one of the Phoenix Four, ha uh, has gone to ask out to keep Pride on a date, she accepts, and... And during the date, though, Colossus does, like, try... Uh, Kitty does sort of question Colossus and the other Phoenix X-Men's mem... Uh, actions across the globe, like, taking... Like, pretty much solving all the world's problems and trying to get rid of all the Avengers. And, of course, this questioning does infuriate Colossus to the point where he does lose control and attack the Jean Grey school. And during his little rampage, though, he hurts Kitty. He hurts Kitty, and that sort of snaps him out of this... And he starts to feel remorse and leaves. And uh, later, the other X-Men, uh, who were part of the Jean Grey school, but then defected to Cyclops' side, uh, decided to come back in this issue. Uh, they were Angel, Iceman, and Rachel Grey. Um, they returned to the school, and pretty much the last scenes are those three X-Men returning to the school. And then, it, and then the last page, though, I liked, because it sort of showed Colossus, who's pretty much all powerful and he's just like walking alone in the arctic i think um i think this issue is really i think would make i don't, I don't know if it would please a lot of Coloss fans of the colossus k pride relationship because i know their relationship was very popular in the x-men titles over the years but uh you know i think it's very i think kind of you know I think they're implying right now that the next member of the Phoenix uh, X-Men who's going to be depower depowered is going to be Colossus. Because I think he's starting to sort of, you know, waver in this. And he want and now he's probably going to start, like, re rethinking the entire X-Men's goal. Especially now since they're all Phoenix-possessed. But, uh, you know, um, Wolverine the X-Men, uh, I would uh, highly recommend this to... K Pride and Colossus fans, because I think they would let, get a kick out of it. And uh, there is a bit at the end where Ba, between Iceman and K Pride, where it you know, kind of shows that I think this issue did show that K still has feelings for, for uh, Colossus, but uh, she's also kind of moving on because she does kind of ask Iceman if she would ever, if he would ever ask, work up the courage to ask her out, which was kind of funny. Um,. Yeah, but I'd say it's a pretty good issue. Okay, moving along. Captain America number 15. Uh, Baron Zemo, who's working with Agent Bravo and Queen Hydra, have pretty much started their the next phase of their plan. And this phase involves these new sort of, I think, android superhumans called the... Uh, what are they called? The Discordians, who have like these weird abilities. They're pretty much sent, sent by Zemo to attack various... Locations like U.S. embassies, military institutions, and the issue ends on their final attack on the United States. And also, there's another part to this plan where apparently Hydra is replacing reporters with their own agents uh, so that they can try to use the public to discredit Captain America. Um, you know, that whole... Now that... I, uh, the whole plan using the press to discredit Captain America, I feel like... That, hasn't that been done before at, at some point? Um, you know, and also, this does seem to pick up off of the, sort of be like a fall, this is kind of a fallout to what happened last story arc with Scourge and Demolition Man. Um, but uh, so, far, and now it seems like they're gonna, they're starting to work up between a fight between uh, Baron Zemo and Captain America, which I kind of look forward to. Um, as far as the way issues start, a story arc starts, though, um, I would say that this isn't, uh, well, it kind of does have its moments, but it's not really a good start. But, uh, you know, if you are a fan of Ed Brubaker, then I would recommend uh, you pick up this last story arc because this is going to be his last, uh, one, this is going to be his last one, because um, right in October, the last two issues of Captain America are going to be out before they relaunch it, so... And that will be the end of Ed Brubaker's run on Captain America. So that's one of the main reasons why I'm sticking with this story arc for now. Okay, moving right along. 
The Amazing Spider-Man 690. Uh, Spider-Man's still fighting Michael Morbius in the, in, in the city, and while he's fighting Morbius, Madame Web appears, and she pretty much tells Spider-Man that he has to get back to Horizon now, or something very terrible and tragic is going to happen. And, of course, Spider-Man's saying, like, not now, I have to deal with this guy, because I don't want to make the same mistake I did last time, and she points out that he's referring to Silver Sable, and, uh, and Madame Web tells him that Silver Sable, Sable is alive. Um, let's face it, some of us knew that Sable was probably going to come back alive. But uh, pretty much, she tells Spider-Man that Sable is alive, because she's seen the future and stuff. And also, but he needs to get back to Horizon right now. So Spider-Man takes out Morbius and heads back to Horizon. And meanwhile, at Horizon Labs, two things are happening. First thing, uh, King the Kingpin has sent someone working for him into Horizon. And they found the plans for the anti-Spider-Sense towers. Like, you know, the towers that were used in Spider Island to jam Spider-Man's Spider-Sense. Uh, they found the plans for that. And the other thing ha that happens involves the Lizard, who's still physically Kurt Connors. Um, basically, Connors is going, trying to figure out a way to completely get re reverse Michael Morbius' cure to turn him back into his reptilian form. But while he's doing this, though, he's sort of experiencing a few th things about humanity that he seems to enjoy, like eating and some music and video games. But during each, almost each time he does enjoy something, he, he infects one of the each member of Horizon's think tank with the lizard, original lizard formula, turning them into reptilian monsters. And so, pretty much, the issue ends with Spider-Man returning to Horizon just as all the lizard uh, think, uh, Horizon scientists break out, get ready to attack. And also, Kurt Connors has perfected uh, the cure, uh, his anti-lizard, the reversal cure. But he can't. But he suddenly, on the final page, he suddenly finds himself unable to sort of inject it. Like now, he's starting to rethink it and think. And now he's sort of considering, like, wait, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to give up this old new life as a human type deal? Um, not bad. I gotta admit, though. Um, I think when I heard that they were gonna do a lizard story arc, I kind of thought that, you know, it was just something they were doing to help promote the Amazing Spider-Man movie, but it's really not. Um, it's also something that, you know, has been lingering ever since they done, ever since they did do the whole, um, reverse kill, killing Kurt Connors prospectively by making the lizard completely take over. Now it seems like the lizard is slowly turning back into Kurt Connors, because he's starting to rediscover his humanity and what he enjoyed about it. I mean, it's not exactly Kurt Connors, but I think the lizard himself is starting to see what is good about being a human. So, you know, kind of a walk a mile in another species' shoes type deal. But uh, it's still pretty. It's still a pretty great story arc. Um, I can't wait to see the conclusion about what's going to happen, what the lizard's choice would be, because that is, because I mean, Dan Slott is still doing an amazing job on. Spider-Man, and he does leave you a teaser for another story arc to come with the Kingpin and everything. Who we haven't seen, who keep in mind that also the Hobgoblin does make a cameo with the Kingpin. So, and he ha I don't think we've seen him since Spider Island. So, something big might be plan might be planning with going on in the Amazing Spider-Man. Okay, moving right along, DC Comics Superman number eleven. Basically, Superman goes to Russia to fight the alien. That was in that submarine capsule. And it turns out that it's a look-like of the Predator. The the alien Predator. That's what this thing looks like. I mean, uh, it's not a 100% copy, but I mean, you can just look at it and just go, wait, is Superman fighting Predator or something? And apparently, uh, fake Predator has this sort of ability to harness weapons that use red solar energy. And that helps him make quick work of Superman. Oh yeah, and apparently Superman's Kryptonian armor is vulnerable to red sunlight. Because right when he gets hit by most of the red sunlight, uh, pieces of the armor come off. And also it starts to turn back into its white neutral form when Superman first found it in Brainiac's ship. So, uh... 
Gotta admit, they weren't being very original with the design of the villain at all. I mean... I, I keep telling myself it's going to get better with this, but I, I really, really find it hard to believe anymore with Superman. Um... You know, I think maybe... I mean, they're going to... I mean, after issue 12, that will be the end of what Dan Jurgens on this on this book, and then they'll switch over to Scott LaBelle, and honestly, I, I'm, not, I'm not even so sure if I want to do that again. Uh, right now, the whole me continuing to pick up Superman is kind of up in the air right now, I'll say that. But, uh, you know, it... This cover is a lie. All right, I'll, I'll tell you right now. This cover is a lie. It says, "Secrets of the suit revealed." We learn nothing except that it's vulnerable to red sunlight. It's not really, not really a secret. Secret. Um, just, uh, you know, it's. It, this is just not worth it. It it really isn't worth three bucks. All right, moving along. Teen Titans number eleven. Wonder Girl's armor starts to sort of possess her, and she starts fighting all the other members of the Teen Titans. She makes quick work of Bunker, and looks like she's killed Bunker, Kid Flash, and Solstice. And right when the issue ends, Superboy and R Red Robin arrive, and Cassie begs for, her, for their help because she's worried she's going to kill again. So now, so pretty much this is going to be a Wonder Girl story arc, okay? And it seems like we're finally going to get some answers into Wonder Girl's past, like how she got her armor and and her lariat, you know, stuff like that. So we'll finally get some answers to that because Wonder Girl was one of the more radically changed characters in the DC universe, and we're not so sure how this. And we're not, and so far we don't really have much of an ans much. We don't really have much of an answer to this, except someone has been sort of been tracking Wonder Girl's armor, so. There is that too. I mean, if you're a Wonder Girl fan, I'm pretty sure you'll find this story arc interesting, to say the least. And also, this issue has a t has sort of a tie, uh, sort of lead into to the to a Kid Flash solo story that's going to take place next month in DC Comics Presents no issue 12, so which I will be getting. So you know, there's two things there. There's a lead into the Kid Flash solo. So tale, and there's also a story arc about Wonder Girl. Maybe we'll finally get some answers to her origin. I look forward to that. Next up, The Flash, number 11. This was actually pretty, uh, pretty funny. Um, first of all, Barry Allen, we all know he died. He, he's legally dead, okay? He can't really be Barry, Barry Allen anymore. So he's moved to Keystone City. He's just pretty much moved to, you know, there's two cities, Central City and Keystone City. And they're both like a bridge apart, literally almost a bridge apart. And Barry just decides he's going to move into Keystone City and just stay there, stay there until he can get most of his life figured out. And when he does, he applies for a job at bar, as a bartender. But he's a bartender at the Rogues Bar. That's one of my favorite things about the Flash villains, the Rogues, is that they kind of have their own bar to hang out in. And I remember when they did this episode of Justice League Unlimited, um, when like when they did that Flash-centered episode about the Flash Museum, uh, Batman was talking to Flash about how s some of his enemies were trying to kill him. He's like, we need to find out where they are. And B Flash is just like, Oh, yeah, there's that bar they hang out at. We can just find answers there. <laughs> that was so fun. That was just so funny. And they brought it back in here, which I'm very happy they sort of brought back the rogues bar. However, it's not necessarily a rogues bar. I mean, the only guy... I mean, there's, like, regular people in there, and the only actual supervillain is Captain Cold. And Barry Allen, in his civilian identity, sort of has a civil conversation. I want to say a normal civil conversation with Captain Cold, but then Heat Wave shows up. And apparently Heat Wave is has some sort of radiator attached to his chest and 
Now, he, and like Captain Cold, he no longer relies on a gun. He ha all his fire powers are within him. Just like Captain Cold and his ice powers. So they, they immediately... And so you've got Captain Cold and you've got Heat Wave. You know what they say? Fire and ice just don't mix. So they have a few, they start having a huge fight. And so Barry Allen sneaks away, changes into the Flash, t makes quick work of them both, and... And all's well that ends well. But, final page of the issue, though. Leonard, uh, Captain Cold, when Captain Cold and Heatwave are in the police van being dragged away to prison, they are suddenly visited by Cold's sister, the Golden Glider. Obviously here to make the same offer she made to Weather Wizard uh, last issue. Okay, well, flash number 11. We're slowly get. I think we're slowly getting reintroduced to each of the rogues, which I like. Okay, I like, I like this whole idea how they're sort of reintroducing us to each member of Flash's rogues gallery, and then I believe for Flash Annual we're gonna get a big reunion of the rogues, which I look forward to because the Flash really does have a, a very interesting cast of villains. I, I will say that he does have a very interesting cast, and I think that's one of the things that makes Flash memorable. Um, so, you know, if you are a fan of the Rogues, I would recommend checking out maybe the next few issues, I believe, and Flash Annual is when the, I believe, is the ro when the Rogues fully return, and also that will lead into Flash 13, which will be like a Rogues-centered story arc, so you'll have that to look forward to. Next up, Aquaman number 11. Okay. First few pages are a flashback where we finally learn where Arthur and the other and all the um, others got their Atlantean artifacts. Uh, Arthur, uh, Aquaman basically takes them to a tomb, and it's apparently the tomb of the first king of Atlantis, who was who pretty much was around, who pretty much died during the sinking of the continent. And so they go there and they get the six artifacts. And then we come back to the present where we have Aquaman, Yahara, and the prisoner reunited with their other former teammates, the operative, and uh, what was his, what's that other guy's name? Vostok. And operative and the operative tells them all where Black Manta is located. And even though the other others offer their assistance to Aquaman, he just refuses and goes by himself. And so Aquaman go finds out, and apparently Manta was at the same tomb where the others discovered the artifacts. And he's there with Dr. Shin, and Manta's there with Dr. Shin, and Arthur learns that Manta kidnapped Shin, but Shin, and Shin says that he's not going to help Manta, and Manta just says, very well. So then he takes the artifact, so Manta uses the two artifacts that he already stole, uh, Yahara's gl teleporting globe from last issue, and also... Uh, the other artifact that was stolen from uh, what's her from uh, the other member at like the start of the story arc, and he uses them to locate a hidden seventh artifact in the cave. And apparently, the item Do Manta want Black Manta wanted was is known as the Scepter of the Dead King, which is apparent, which was apparently used to sink Atlantis. Okay, well, there's an interesting little twist about what Manta was after. Um, pretty much, they're playing up to some sort of final showdown with Aquaman and Black Manta, and I think eventually the others are going to find them and join in as well. And I think when the others left Aquaman to go deal with Manta, they, Yahara said, in order to help Aquaman, we're going to need her. I think she referred to Mara. Also, I want to point out, Mara wasn't with Black Manta because... Obviously, Manta just took Shin with him when he left the Good Doctor's home. Alright, Aquaman. Aquaman definitely shaping up to be a great comic book series. I mean, I think Aquaman is one of the characters that definitely benefited from this relaunch because, I mean, Jeff Johns has done an amazing job on this book because Aquaman was always like the bunt of everyone's superhero jokes, but now he's, he's doing very well in his own series. I, I will say that, and... I highly recommend you pick it up. Although, seeing as how we're getting like to the end of the other story arc, I think you may you're probably better off waiting until we start a new one at this point. 
All right, next, and speaking of starting a new story arc, a new one begins in Green Lantern, number 11, The Return of Black Hand. <clears throat> okay, first of all, continuing up from what we had from last issue, uh, Sinestro has been freed from the Indigo Tribe's control, and here's the good, another piece of good news. While he was getting freed from his brainwashing, uh, Hal had... The Indigo Lantern Guardian uh, Natromo uh, reversed the reversed the control link that was between Hal and Sinestro's rings. Where now, instead of Sinestro controlling Hal Jordan's ring, Hal now controls Sinestro's. <laughs> that was that was probably one of the best parts of this issue. So, anyways, and uh, and anyways, while this is going while this is going on. Uh, Black Hand is back on Earth, and he goes to, and he goes to a graveyard where he revives his two brothers and his parents. And apparently, they're not Black Lanterns; they're just zombies. That's it. They're just walking corpses. That's it. There's no, you know, black. There's no black rings. There's no Black Lantern symbol. There's no possessed, corrupted intelligence. They're just Zombies, that's it. Okay? And, and of course, while Black Hand's re having his little family reunion, uh, ha Indigo 1 teleports Sinestro and Hal back to Korugar, where, where after discovering that Black Hand escaped and he's dead, Sinestro, Sinestro and Hal go... Sinestro takes Hal to his sort of hidden base on, Kor on Korugar, which Hal comments like, so this is your bat cave. And so and Sinestro shows how the Book of Black, which Sinestro took from one of his uh from uh that former Sinestro Corps member a couple of issues ago. And so when how and so when they open the Book of Black, uh the Book of Black does show some stuff that's supposed to come out of the uh war uh Rise of the Third Army story arc that's supposed to take place across all the lantern books in October. And then it teleports Hal and Sinestro right to Black Hand's home. All right. Well, well, guess the story is needless to say. Black Hand is back. However, even though he does have a Black Lantern ring and he can raise the dead, he's not as powerful as he was in Blackest Night. Okay? There aren't, like I said, there aren't any Black Power rings. They're just, he's just reanimating corpses at this point. That's that's basically it. I think. Even though William Hand is undead, um, he's not connected to Necron. So that has significantly decreased his power at this point. And seeing as how... And I don't really consider this a full sequel to Blackest Night. I consider it more of a sequel just for Black Hand. I mean, if you enjoyed Black Hand... In Blackest Night, I think you'll probably enjoy this for a bit. But uh, if you're expecting some sort of sequel to Blackest Night and all this, uh, don't hold your breath. I'd say it's just pretty much, it's not concentrated across the DC Universe. It's just between Sinestro, Hal Jordan, and Black Hand. That's it. That's, all I can, that's really all I can say is that how far this is going to go. And again, and like I said, Black Hand isn't really all that powerful. He just is able to create zombies. That's it, okay? So we've got really more... So pretty much what I view this story arc, this new story arc, The Return of Black Hand, just basically a a, a trimmed-down version of Blackest Night. That's all I see it as. Okay, well, that's it for this week. Um, quick little recap. Green Lantern number 11, the trimmed-down version of Blackest Night, trimmed-down version of Blackest Night begins here. Aquaman number 11, still awesome. Really enjoying how the others. Can't wait to see how it ends. The Flash number 11, slowly we're getting reintroduced to the Rogues. Can't wait to see when they get all when they get the band back together. Teen Titans number 11, or we may finally get some backstory on Wonder Girl. Also, Kid Flash, a lead into Kid Flash's solo adventure. Superman number 11, I'm definitely. Starting to consider dropping this book now. Amazing Spider-Man 669. 
Wait, 690, sorry. 690, um, the lizard, the lizard is close to complete, has completed his formula to change it back to reptile, but he's not sure if it's what he really wants. Also, Madam Web gave Spider-Man a vi big vision about the future. Not so sure what it means. And Captain America number 15. The beginning of the end, this is the beginning of Ed Brubaker's last story arc. I really hope it has a strong payoff. And Wolverine the X-Men number 14. Uh, I think fans of the Kitty and Kitty Pride Kloss relationship will enjoy this. Everyone else, it's just a tie into Avengers vs. X-Men. And that is my comic review for this week. Um, yep, that's it. That's it. Um, I did order some more trade paperbacks, so I might be... So expect a few mail time episodes over the course of the next few days. And however, though, I think by the time I get those books, I'm not going to be able to show them off in the GN monthly for July. They'll probably make it in August, though. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Spider-Man 1991 saying see you later.